Okay, we're going to stay on time because we do have lunch at noon. So if you will sit through one more with us, uh, then I promise I'm going to buy all of you lunch. Okay, if I could get uh, Tim Zank from Sapphire Energy to come up. There he is. All right, and Tim Olson and Bill Kinney. And Brian Bilbray. Is Brian here yet? I haven't seen him. We'll find him. Yeah, the, sur the, the surf's up. Brian, Brian may be running late. He may come in at the end to, to, to say a few words. Okay, so, so clearly one of the challenges, uh, you know, that we have is technical. And, and you've heard a little bit about those for the first two sessions, right? What are the hurdles we get over? How do we really drive the economics? Um, how do we make the, the, the technical advances that are going to give us a chance to get these fuels economically viable? Um, but, you know, the other side of the equation, uh, of course, is how do we get the policies and the regulations in place that will, first of all, allow this to happen and hopefully encourage and enable it to happen? And so that's what we are going to talk a little bit about this morning. And so our first speaker is uh, Tim Zank. Uh, from Sapphire Energy, and he is going to tell us about biofuel development in the regulatory landscape from Sapphire's perspective. Okay, great. I'll be happy to lead this off. Thanks very much. Tim Zank with Sapphire. I am uh, the Vice President of Corporate Affairs. Part of my role is regulatory and a number of other things. But um, I think what I was asked to do is to provide sort of a case study of Sapphire's experience with vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, always explaining why we decided to uh, locate our first commercial demonstration in New Mexico v versus a uh, three-hour drive in the Imperial Valley or someplace closer than a four or five-hour airplane flight for our team. Uh, and we also have a large 22-acre um, uh, outdoor research center in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I think it boils down to um, we trade time for money. And uh, locating any facility, especially an energy facility that's resource intense like algae production or agriculture, uh, is a very difficult task uh, in the state of California. And I might add that the um, uh, nearly impossible, and I think, I, I think the best uh, analog to look at is how many uh, alternative fuel companies do you see actually producing or pro providing uh, facilities here in the state of California? Does anybody know? We do. How many? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my few. head. Uh, well, a dozen, a dozen, at least. A, at dozen. Least a dozen. There's a dozen in New Mexico. Uh, so uh, the the point is is that uh, the regulatory environment is not conducive to establishing uh, commercial uh, entities in the state of California. There are a number of issues. Uh, and by the way, the environmental standards are no different in the state of California than they are in the state of New Mexico. They simply are not any different. We all live uh, and die by the same federal laws, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. Uh, they have their own version of a CEQA in the state of New Mexico. But what we found that was different was the ability to go through a permit process in a fairly expedited time because uh, we had a governor and we had uh, elected officials who were interested in our business. So let me just start out by explaining to you the timeline that we went through, which is in 2007, we had a great idea. It sort of evolved in the back uh, bench of a, of a laboratory at Scripps and Mayfield's lab in those days. In 2008, we were awarded $100 million from investors uh, because of this idea. In 2009, we received another $104.5 million on a competitive uh, process with the Department of Energy and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to build a commercial demonstration. That was in December. In 2010, we finalized our fi financing. In 2011, we raised the capital and designed a project and permitted a project uh, that was then uh, turned on in operations uh, by 2012 in the state of New Mexico. 300 acres of improved land, 5,000 acres total. Uh, uh, we went through uh, all the, we went through two FONSIs, which is the Federal uh, Order of Non-Significant non Environmental Impact. We permitted the project as you would in any state, in any part of the country. 
uh, and we uh, turned the facility on one year exactly later uh, uh, to operate it in uh, in, in, the state of New, in the state of New Mexico in a place called Columbus, a very small town. So um, that was our experience with New Mexico. Um, all the analytical work that we did to look at the possibility of doing this in the state of California led to the conclusion that uh, it was uh, impossible to achieve those op uh, with all the obstacles before us. I look at two areas of policy, and I'll finish up here, and I won't go any deeper than that. Uh, appropriations on the finance side, AB 118 and others, and policy authorizations, the authorizations committee, the policy associated with the state of California. Why would we locate a facility in, 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 uh, in the state of California where AB 32 uh, works against us? The law, uh, the law that uh, establishes our ability to develop clean uh, energy systems in the state of California essentially favors alcohols and other substances that are uh, low in the tailpipe emissions. On a life, the AB, the CARB abandoned the use of life cycle assessment in their analysis of these fuels. That's a big mistake. We all know that ethanol and biodiesel and other sources of less inferior fuels, uh, uh, less inferior fuels. Um, um, uh, have a higher uh, life cycle assessment, greenhouse gas uh, assessment, than uh, fuels like algae. We consume a lot of CO2 in the process of, of growing. But nonetheless, the policy of the state and, and, the, uh, and, and CARB's approach to that was that they didn't have the detail necessary to establish an effective life cycle assessment policy, which essentially resulted in the favoring uh, uh, technologies that weren't related to algae, uh, algae. So based on those policies, it makes it uh, rather difficult for entrepreneurs like us to understand uh, you know, why we should locate a facility in the state of California. Now, there are advantages in that, in that uh, the low carbon fuel standard and other areas of, of the law can, uh, you know, can be of assistance to us. But the bottom line is that um, I think it's the totality of issues we face in California to build and permit and then sell fuels into the marketplace that uh, really restricts our ability to locate a facility here in uh, the state of California. Okay. Well, we have some time for questions then. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with one. Yes, Tim, sir. Tim, so you said that the, that the actual regulations in New Mexico and California are, are similar. Well, it's federal law. Come on. Right, with some probably state and municipal added on top of it. But would it be possible then? So, so your biggest risk, my understanding is your biggest risk was a time risk. Not that ultimately you couldn't get a facility permitted here. It's that you, you didn't perceive that it could be done in the same time frame that it was achieved in Mexico, in New Mexico. If at all. It, it, be, because you just think it would be dragged out so long that eventually you'd give up or it just Look, wouldn't. The, the CEQA process is extremely difficult for any company extremely difficult for companies that are startup and uh, uh, don't have the legal uh, you know, capability to fight yeah. lawsuit after lawsuit. So one of the things that we've discussed, you know, sort of kicked around here in, in SDCAB, is this idea of maybe pre-permitting. So actually going to a location in some place like Imperial Valley and then you know, maybe through, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure which group would do it, but, but, but we would actually file for permits, not because we had a specific project to put there, but to actually create an economic zone in which all the permits were already available so that all a company like Sapphire or Synthetic Genomics or General Atomics would have to do is come and occupy a footprint of that pre-approved site. D d does that seem like something that's brilliant idea. It's been used around the country for other types of important uh, economic uh, policies to implement uh, new uh, industries. Absolutely. It's, a, it's, you know, there's, there's international trade zones around the country. There are any number of models that are similar to what you're talking about that yeah. address the permitting issues up front. Nobody yeah. wants to, nobody uh, in the industry wants to build a bad project or don't 
not meet all of the environmental requirements and conditions under the law. That's a risk that would not be, uh, in, uh, you know, that wouldn't be a good business decision. Yep. Uh, the point is, is that it's time yep. in litigation that we can't simply, uh, we can't simply, uh, you know, address. Right, but 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 if there was a different organization, maybe to take on that part of the risk. Yeah, I mean. It, my experience, as you know, I'm a government guy, so yeah. my experience with this is that it really has to start at the top. You have to have somebody in the governor's office or somebody yeah. at a very high level uh, within the agency that coordinates the agencies, stops the interagency uh, squabbles that occur in large projects that use a lot of resources, you know, water, <laughs> land, yeah. et cetera, CO2. Uh, so, yeah, you, you need somebody to coordinate and streamline the process, especially yeah. for new companies. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I know many of us here think about are, are when, when we look at the, uh, the Salton Sea and the sort of Im impending environmental disaster that's about to show up there, that I think we have a, a fantastic opportunity to, you know, as the saying goes, to kill two birds with one stone, you know, to, to mitigate the environmental problems that are showing up there and at the same time get a pre-permitted energy park that uh, commercial guys could show up to participate in. I'm sure we have some questions here. Greg? Yeah, I wanted to follow up with uh, uh, Jimmy because there is a... Wait a minute. Poor Bill hasn't said anything yet. He has to have a chance <laughs> to at least talk before you start drilling. Fire away. That's okay. Well, uh, you know, we're, we're Tim, but I mean, there, there is, I'm just pointing it, I mean, Tim's aware of this, I'm wondering if he, if he's aware of it, or if there's some type of, is that this uh, AB 642, which would have you know, went through the assembly and the Senate, and it, it, it really addresses exactly the question that you were just talking about, that it's sort of a larger political economy in California for a matter of whether there are regions where it might create an emergency. But, and, and, you know, I think it's worth looking into, since you're not going to have a, a chance to comment on this, but I question if Bill, you're familiar with this. Uh, and, and if so, you know, what's your thoughts on that? I'm not. Uh, I haven't followed that. Uh, we, uh, another, another guy in our office has, has been keeping on, on top of that. Um, I, I'm mainly focused on getting money out the door and approving, evaluating projects, recruiting uh, firms into our uh, solicitation process and so on. But um, we have, I mean, a CalRecycle put through a programmatic EIR for biogas from landfills. Uh, it wasn't cheap. I mean, they put a lot of uh, man hours into that. But that's possible. That's the kind of thing that you could do. Um, Algae is, is kind of a unique situation. Um, I mean, what we, we've approved, a, you know, kind of jumping the gun here, but we've approved 33 projects in the last four years for a total of $91 million. Uh, at least a third of those are commercial, but they're small. They're, they're locally resource-based, okay? They have feedstocks that are coming from, from local sources, and so they scale appropriately. But um, they are commercial, and they are competitive. So, you know, just a kind of a preview of what, what I'm going to talk about. Okay. Well, one, one more question. Fire it out, Jonathan. Sure. What, what is the mechanism that you get from the data? You'll have to speak up because I can't hear you. You have a very cooperative executive structure within the Within the, uh, uh, within the state, they're hungry for uh, developers of projects. Uh, it doesn't, they have a, uh, for example, Governor Richardson, current governor as well, has a executive policy team that comes together. They're all the senior players within his cabinet that sit at the table and work out these permitting issues. It doesn't mean they cut you a break, it means they coordinate. Uh, they don't fight amongst themselves because they're all at the table. They had a, biofuels plan in place of how to attract companies to the area, how to work with them, what their key resources were, uh, what it was the, gov the government was going to put in place to help you. No money on the table, by the way. This wasn't an issue where they put a couple million dollars or five, ten, hundred million dollars on the table. They had, what they had was a organized plan to, to do business in the state of New Mexico. And that's what we would need to see here in the state of California. Arizona has actually just, uh, 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 in the last year, has actually just done the same thing. Nevada, not so much, more focused on electrification. But you're not going to the governor about the upcoming litigation that's coming in 
I'm blaming, yeah, I would say that there is a, a sort of a lack of coordination in the state of California that ultimately results in, uh, uh, in uh, our inability to see our way through a process that makes time, that makes sense from a time perspective. And then also, there are some overarching issues around CEQA that are just insurmountable for small companies. And we got to fix that. I mean, we have all the potential in the world in the state of California to build these projects. And we have uh, all the resources in the world here. Uh, and, you know, if the state hopes to achieve its, its uh, greenhouse gas requirements, we better build energy projects here or else we're not going to achieve those objectives. You can't do it by electrification alone. It's just okay. not possible. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to questions later, but I want to stay on time and make sure that I have all the speaker stock. Um, next is Bill Kinney. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, next is Tim Olson from the California Energy Commission. Bill, you'll get your chance, don't worry. Okay. Right, okay. Okay, and uh, Congressman Bilbrey just arrived too. So. <laughs> but Brian, it's not your turn to talk yet, please. Okay, Tim. Okay, appreciate the uh, uh, chance to make comments here. And um, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Tim Olson, the manager of our Transportation Energy Office at the California Energy Commission previously involved in setting up this fund, the AB 118 fund, and advisor to two different commissioners in the past. Um, I, I want to just kind of also kind of point out some of the, th the three functions that our agency um, conducts that, uh, that address the topic to today. And that's we provide incentives uh, for um, alternative fuel, renewable fuel, vehicle infrastructure development. Um, we take kind of a polyfuel approach to work we're spreading across the board. It's about a hundred million dollars a year, approximately twenty million dollars a year dedicated for biofuel um, projects, mostly deployment related. We also fund research and development to accelerate technology advances. David F. Ross is part of that program. And we also have a third function evaluate deployment, progress, uh, economics, policies, forecast fuel and price, uh, fuel of demand, price, and assess supply scenario. So we, we're basically sizing this up all the time. Stephen, you asked a question earlier, um, and you said uh, challenges don't try to solve problems. I think we're eventually gonna get into some of the ideas and how to solve these, uh, even though that you kind of warned us not to do that. Um, and uh, so I look at three things I'd like to kind of talk about the challenges. Uh, one is, and I'm gonna pose these in the form of questions. Um, do the existing federal and state laws policy programs provide sustainable guidance and support? We heard from Tim Zank, maybe not in some cases, or it needs to be improved. That, uh, that's one area that we, we, I think we need to focus on. Two, do we, have cha do we have a good understanding? This is, tends to be a viewpoint of government, also industry, and investment. Do we have a good understanding of how and when advanced biofuel projects will achieve commercial scale production? And three, how can government funds programs be configured to make a difference? I wanna kinda go into that point of what difference means. Uh, so just taking a kind of a, a deep dive into each three areas. Um, we think that there's several policies and programs in place to be supportive and provide that guiding light. Uh, Tim mentioned some of the AB32, low carbon fuel standard. They, they have quantitative targets. They have uh, some timelines associated with them. Uh, the tailpipe emission standards, these tend to be a California Air Resources Board programs. Then at the national level, you've got this kind of effort to reduce ambient air quality standards by 2023, kind of put a big uh, restriction on combustion technologies and the mobile sector, particularly in South Coast Service te Territory, South Coast Air Quality Management District, and San Joaquin Valley. Um, we also think that, uh, that there are some things in place to diversify transportation fuels, our alternative fuels plan, um, and then incentives under AB 118, and at the national level, the RFS 2. Now, there are definitely problems and challenges with each one of those. Some of it has to do with getting money out the door quickly. Some of it has to do with if you have a standard at RFS 2, but then you waive it for cellulosic, advanced biofuel, biodiesel every year, where's the real, where's the real pressure to have anything done? Um, 
And we think that there's another area here we'd like to talk about, and that's providing research and development funding. This is a big question in the future for the Energy Commission. That's a challenge. Um, I think the other, other thing we wanted to kind of talk about is that there's a, an effort to stimulate in-state biofuel development. That's the Bioenergy Action Plan. We expect to have 40% of our biofuel consumption in the year 2020 coming from in-state sources. Well, what does that mean in terms of, how do you translate it into projects? It's probably in the range of, uh, if you use E10 or E15 blends as a, um, as a kind of a surrogate for how to achieve that, um, that's probably 15 to 25 pretty significant plants, biorefineries in the range of 50 million gallons per year production. Uh, if we have, if we're putting as Bill Kenny said, now up $91 million of government funds into that kind of pre-development, kind of creating a stable of pre-development projects. How do you get, what does that mean in terms of capital investment? I think in the range of three to $4 billion of investment. So that's gonna be kind of the next point is, is uh, how do we use that money? To, how do you use our money to stimulate that other private money that's really needed? I want to go to the second point. Do we have a good understanding of how and when advanced biofuel projects will achieve commercial scale production? And I think, again, it's worth posing some questions about, um, well, uh, one question, time. When will commercial scale production occur? Anthony Eggert was asking this earlier. Uh, location, where will the development occur? Magnitude, how much fuel can be produced? Cost, at what price point will biofuels compete in blends or neat fields? Uh, what is the cost to consumer at that point in time? Investment, how much capital investment is required to get these projects on the ground? Who makes the investment? And will we, will we be investing in infrastructure that may become stranded assets or are they strategic transition options to other things? Uh, process, getting to Tim Zink's comment, what's the optimal balance of environmental review and expedient development? I think that's, that's, a, that's a big challenge that we face. Um, market, we look at things like what business models emerge, exist or could emerge that spur this market growth. And, um, and one aspect of that, do consumers have choices with those models? And then we look at things like uh, what market niche are likely to be first into the market. Um, this kind of third point, are government funds and programs configured to make a difference? I want to go back to that. How many projects do we need on the ground and how much money? Three to four billion dollars, 20 to 30 projects. Uh, our, our, grant, our, our kind of a business as usual, the grants, the co-funding approach we take now, is that the best way to structure this to attract that private investment? Do we continue building the stable of pre-development projects, where many of them are, many of them are in this pilot stage, uh, maybe in research, pilot stage, uh, pre-commercial, um, what, what does it take to uh, advance them into the commercial? Um, I think the, a couple other points here, are there optional mechanisms to maximize that leverage of government and private money? I have some ideas that there tend to be solutions to that, but you didn't ask for that, so we're not, I'm not going to go into them. Um, and, but there are ways of structuring government incentives in, in conjunction with uh, private sources that haven't been really done very well, pools of money that just haven't been coordinated uh, very well, and they sh probably should be. Um, what are the options to establish the kind of a uniform CEQA treatment and permit approval? I think those are challenges that need to be on the table and addressed. And then, it's, it's true, what's existing today only works partially, maybe not well. I think Sapphire Energy is the example of a pioneer that faced all of this at the front end and got frustrated and left. And um, so we, we don't want that happening. We want to we wanna look at that. And then I think it gets to this point of uh, can government act as a facilitator? What ways can we act as a facilitator either in either directly or indirectly through your type of organization or other entities, sharing, collecting data, evaluating performance, results of field tests and, and uh, pilot projects, conducting peer reviews, confirming life cycle analysis, that stuff still needs to be on the table. 
uh, to address those uh, policy objectives. And just one kind of closing comment here. Um, we, ha we are facing, in terms of money, we're facing challenges on reauthorization of funds. The R&D program has already faced this last, last year. It, was, it had been a surcharge on electricity and natural ga gas rates in this state. That did not get reauthorized by the legislature. And as a result, it was restored by the Public Utilities Commission, but through an administrative process. Biofuel research is not high on their priority list. And it has a lot to do with uh, how you tie it to rate payer benefits. Um, the AB 118 funds expire in January 2016. We tried to do a reauthorization this last year and fell short by two votes. It, and this is considered a two-thirds vote tax increase, so it has lots of, lots of objections. And, um, and I think no matter what the progress is, it's going to be tough. Federal extensions, same thing. Extensions are not assured given the environment. And um, the uh, LCFS, AB 32, we, the, the bigger criticism comes from the industries that are targeted in, in the form of lawsuits and uh, efforts to try to um, stop those, those uh, programs and, and regulations. So one kind of final question. Um, when we look, if we don't, if we're not going to have progress and continued extension of uh, federal state incentives, this question of can sustainable development of the large molecule sustainable fuel occur with private investment only? And that, so the bunch of challenges. Love to come back at some point and talk about solutions of this too. Okay. So, so I think there were about 64 questions there that Tim put to us. So the good news is you didn't have to memorize all of those. We are going to transcribe these. We will get these out to the bigger group. Um, we, we have time for a couple of questions. I, I do just want to make one comment, though. The increase in the price of gas that we've seen over the last 10 days amounts to about $40 million a day in taxes or additional fees that we're paying in the state. So Bill just said we put in $91 million. That seems like a big number. That's about two and a half days of the penalty that we paid over the last 10 days. Um, so how we set our priorities and decide to cut back on this at the same time we're complaining about it, you know, cut, cut back on, on investment, uh, bring technologies that might drive that down, why we equally scream about it is beyond me, but we've done that. Uh, one or two quick questions. Up here. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and who should be responsible for <laughs> organizing that? Yeah. Right? You know, if, if that's seen as a utility and you have the ability through FERC process, which you don't today, to permit a, a, a CO2 pipeline uh, to get it to the locations necessary to cultivate algae, I think that would be seen as a, so there's a little federal law we need to get worked on here. Uh, but, uh, but certainly that's a significant advantage. Um, you're right. Uh, uh, the green line that extends all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up into New Mexico and Arizona and other places uh, is a real advantage uh, in that they have, uh, you know, significant sources of CO2, albeit too pure for the needs of algae, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's there and, and usable. And I think that, uh, uh, the, you know, the other thing that is necessary for algae is sun sunlight and plentiful sources of uh, saline or brackish water. Uh, that is a, that you can access in a sustainable manner. Uh, so uh, those are those are things that go into the development of that project. All right, thank you. So so we're going to stay on time and uh, jump over now to Bill Kinney uh, from the California Energy Commission. And I have some slides. Okay, I there think they're up. Okay, my name is Bill Kinney. I work in the Emerging Fuels and Technology Office at the Energy Commission. I am the technical lead for biofuels production at EFTO. 
Uh, next slide. Let's see, how do I do this? All right. Um, so the state has some key policy objectives, and these are sort of incorporated into uh, almost everything that we do. Um, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, reduce petroleum consumption, displace pe petroleum consumption with biofuels, increase alternative and renewable fuel use, uh, and increase increase in-state biofuels production. Um, now, we're having a slow start on these objectives, uh, but we're beginning to build the capacity we need to achieve uh, the 2020 goals. All right, next slide. Um, next slide. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Right, sorry. Uh, so I don't want to dwell on this. Uh, key take-home messages here. Uh, we have, in AB 118, we have seven investment categories, um, if I counted right. Uh, the allocations are proposed by the staff and approved by our advisory board. Uh, they do fluctuate somewhat uh, from year to year, but uh, biofuels is, seems to be settling into an average of about 20 million a year, uh, more or less. Uh, depending on the state of the economy, we are dependent on um, special fees, uh, license uh, plate fees, and therefore um, that can go up and down with the economic health. Next slide. So. Um, Commercialization and deployment of biofuel production facilities. Can we get the next slide? Yes, I'm Thanks. sorry. Okay. It's there. Uh, yeah, okay. So as we evaluate proposals, we are looking for um, projects that we can see a clear path to commercialization, competitive commercialization and deployment of production facilities. Uh, and that's a major driver that, that uh, kind of goes through all our, our scoring criteria. Um, the, the main ones, uh, well, these are pretty much all of them, but uh, I've summarized uh, the last one, sustainability, collapsed them in there. But we want to see technology transformation. We want to see market penetration, the ability, um, you know, market research, uh, uh, well-identified target markets, uh, niche markets or whatever. Uh, a credible team and an implementation plan, what we call project readiness, uh, and the CEQA is the 800-pound gorilla in project readiness, obviously. Uh, economics are increasingly important to the state and to local economies uh, in our current uh, economic uh, climate. Uh, we want to see budget efficiency. In other words, we're looking for the bang for the buck. And then sustainability, and that's I kind of want to focus on sustainability. But that's, uh, we look at carbon intensity, we look at resource efficiency, and we look at either minimal impacts on the resource base or even mitigation resource remediation. Uh, for instance, using uh, the Salton Sea as a, as a source of nutrients. Um, okay, next slide. So, um, what we look at in economic and, and environmental sustainability is um, the carbon intensity, uh, production cost, and the use of land, air, and water resources. Um, all of these are dependent on both feedstock production as well as your conversion technology and the efficiency of that technology. Land use uh, change occurs if any energy crop displaces feed or food crops when cropland uh, resources are fully employed. Uh, and of course, worldwide, that's, that's not true. Uh, um, these, these definitions are always tricky, but, um, but uh, I, so I, I want to talk to um, uh, Greg about the, um, the 2.5 billion acres available, but, um, but we have land in, the, in, the, in this state that is uh, become unproductive as a result of past irrigation practices. Um, water is going to be very important because of the changing climate, perhaps more arid and drought prone than in the past, and uh, we have a very high opportunity cost for water in this state because we're so interconnected in a system. If you start using more water in the uh, Imperial Valley, that affects uh, the availability and price of water right here in San Diego. So, um, and then uh, finally, the energy intensity of your feedstock production and biomass conversion process 
um, that will affect your carbon intensity. Okay, so next slide. Now, the carbon economy, and, and, and this is what, from our four years and three solicitations, we're starting to see a trend, all right? And we're starting to see a trend in terms of um, the most successful, I would say, aggressively commercial uh, proposals are in the category of diesel substitutes. So we have three fuel categories. That's gasoline substitutes, diesel substitutes, and biomethane. Why is, why is the diesel substitute um, moving ahead uh, in terms of uh, their success in our scoring scheme? Well, they seem to have better financing. They seem to be better organized. Their technology seems to be moving faster. Uh, there's some technological maturity involved in that. But what we think, and what I think, I guess, is the most prominent uh, factor that's different is that we have a very healthy uh, RIN or RFS2 uh, credit market that's functioning at the federal level. And that's a bankable, those credits are bankable when you go to a financing source. Uh, the other fuel types are struggling for lining up their financing and therefore their technology is not moving as fast because of the lack of that kind of robust credit market. Um, so we look at the, as everyone has said, the, fu the full life cycle analysis of biofuel production, including the feedstock production, the conversion technologies, and the distribution of the fuel, and so on. Um, criteria emissions are part of our sustainability metric, and um, we look to um, our applicants to um, credibly uh, address those. So the carbon intensity determines the weight or number of credits per gallon, and then the market trading uh, mechanism establishes the price or value per credit. Um, right now, uh, I guess uh, diesel substitute credits are in the range of $1.35 to $1.40, $1.50. Um, many of our applicants have been approved through um, the EPA uh, for their credit, their credit weight or a number they get one and a half to one and three quarters credits per gallon. So you add that, you multiply that times the value and you get over $2 a gallon. That's, a, that's basically a direct subsidy to the producer and, it, and offers an, an incredible competitive advantage compared to fossil fuels or, or any other um, fuel type. Okay. Um, so volatile and uncertain fossil fuel prices will increase the risk of biofuel deployment, and that's why we think the credits are, are um, sort of a, a, a good insurance policy. Um, now, uh, so um, just to kind of address some of the questions that have arisen, I mean, every firm has to make their own decision about location based on their resource needs, their feedstock type, um, their technology, um, and we, we appreciate that. Um, but we've had 140 applications and three solicitations. Um, you know, the, the subscription is like four times what we've been able to um, uh, allocate because we only had so, mu so much money to allocate. Um, and the CEQA process is difficult, but, um, you know, the, the, the latest round of um, funding, which we just released the, the latest round of, of this uh, most recent solicitation, and we required that um, the local uh, uh, lead, lead CEQA agency uh, provide us with a documentation of their approval of um, these projects. So we've had, you know, two solicitations where we've pretty much already gone through that process. Those uh, application, applicants, those firms, those projects have already been approved locally. Uh, this latest round, we've got a few that they're still in the process of uh, making their determination, but I would say about two-thirds of them have already gotten some kind of a notice of uh, 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 mitigated declaration or um, various other um, alternatives. I, I think we only have, I'm going to say, Tim, at most 20 percent 
of our projects now are feasibility studies. Um, 40 to 50 percent are in the demonstration scale, and then the remaining 40, 30 to 40 percent are uh, small scale commercial for the most part. We have had some applicants that are proposing projects up to um, 20 million gallons a year. So um, it's, it is happening. Now, we have a Byzantine uh, structure as far as uh, CEQA approval because uh, typically it, it tends to be a, a local agency. So that creates a, a patchwork of inconsistency across different jurisdictions and I'm we're we're very sympathetic because we've had to struggle to get our projects you know pushed through the CEQA process so we're very sympathetic of, the, of that but at the same time there is progress that's being made now California also has the problem as many of our air basins are non-attainment basins so we have uh, you know the local agencies they have to apply the federal law and they have very stringent things that they can allow that to ha have happen in terms of fugitive emissions or whatever. So we do have uh, those kinds of problems and our air basins are connected almost as much as or maybe more than our water systems. So we have a very complex economy, a very large economy, uh, and I think, you know, ironically, our current governor, uh, who is a very strong supporter when CEQA got started, uh, is now trying to streamline it because uh, he recognizes that, you know, we've, we've, we've kind of let the heart, you know, we've, we've kind of created something that, that uh, needs to be streamlined, okay? So um, I would just have to say that, you know, for the firms that want to produce for the California market, and hopefully we will have LCFS credits available to those firms in the near future that will further subsidize their production, um, I think that's, you know, there, there is a, a, we're starting to see uh, a panoply of projects and applicants out there now that, that can um, produce anywhere from 10 to 40 million gallons a year. Um, and uh, we see a lot of projects in the 5 to 10 million gallons a year because they're locally based. But um, uh, so, so as I look at the competitive landscape, we, th we think that we need a mixture of small locally based uh, commercial projects as well as the larger scale ones so okay good we have time for just a couple of quick questions anyone so I'll, I'll, I'll pull one up to you Bill so I, I just looked at the projects that were approved and almost all of these are small-scale biorefineries in which they've taken existing waste oil and converted it over to biodiesel right. so I understand how those can get through the sequel process really quick but I think what Tim Zenk was talking about is something totally different because it's one thing to approve a project which is sort of an, an immediate well we can make biofuel by taking some waste oil and converting it into it which at the end of the day is going to be a trivial literally a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of fuel that we need in California and and what Sapphire and other groups are trying to do are really game changers you know could we do something that would really produce the billions of gallons that we produce here every year and I think those are two completely different beasts when it comes to the regulatory process, but also two completely different beasts when it comes to really addressing the problems we have in California if we're going to get to 20% renewables, right. right? Well, I mean, I, you, you raise a good point, but I, I have uh, kind of a, a contrarian philosophy here. You know, I, I see the possibility for um, 60 or 80, uh, 5 to 10 million gallon uh, projects or, or more around the state based on those local waste-based resources. Um, they all have to go through the same, the same bar, but clearly there is a public input process and you have a larger project, then you're going to attract more public input to sure. a larger project. Yep. And that's going to stir up the hornet's nest, yep. right? But they all have to, this is the same bar, they all have to get over. Um, so um, I, I actually think that, that the, I, the it, basically what you described, the large scale, the regional project is really a 20th century industrial model, all right? And maybe that's the appropriate uh, way, but I think a mixture of 20 to 40 million gallon pro, uh, year, year projects 
versus uh, dozens of these smaller projects, uh, we can get uh, quite a bit of fuel out of that. A billion gallons, I haven't done the, I haven't done the math yet, but um, to, to how many we would need, but, um, but I think we, we need a, a diverse strategy. Okay. Any last questions? Okay, good. Then we're going to stay on time. So our final speaker, I am very happy to say, some of you may recognize the gentleman that walked in a little late, Congressman Brian Bilbray. Without my surfboard. Without his surfboard. It, the winds weren't right this morning, so I know you weren't really out there because I went and looked early. Um, and so he's going to tell us a little bit about the federal perspective on, uh, on, on biofuels and renewable fuels, and hopefully a little bit about how that mix uh, impacts us here in California and San Diego. Absolutely. And I, let me first, as a disclaimer, I do not come from the business background or the science background, but I come from the regulatory background. I was 10 years with the Air District here in San Diego County and uh, six years with the Air Resources Board, working with some of the best scientists in the world. And um, I really think that this issue of <clears throat> what we would call uh, next generation green fuels can really be a teaching moment to us as a general community. Uh, ever since my involvement in 1970 with environmental movement, there's been this adversarial approach between the environmental community and the business community. And it's always been a conflict. I ha really believe that the challenge of going to next generation green fuels can be a chance for both sides to learn to work together, which is essential. So what I would like to propose to you as not as a businessman or a scientist, but as a government regulator and, a, and somebody who sits on the energy committee and uh, does the environmental regulations related to it, uh, that we need next generation government. Because we need to move away from the concept that the place for government is to mandate and to subsidize, to write checks and to write laws forcing people to do the right thing. And it frustrates me, if I may digress, that, that all of the talk we, we make in Washington about the fact that we require auto manufacturers to have great cafe standards. We require oil companies to have clean fuels. But even in an institution like UC San Diego, we do not require that a state institution on state property with, with um, government funds stop putting up stop signs at every corner that can be five times more polluting and not having one. No, we don't require the UC system to put roundabouts in and rather traffic lights, which are 22.6% less polluting and less fuel consuming. We're quick to tell the private sector to clean up their act, but ourselves, we exempt. The Clean Air Act doesn't require local government to do anything about traffic management from the fuel consumption of the Cl Clean Air Act. This is the kind of blindsided that I think that we need to look at ourselves about. So I think there's an opportunity for the business community to work with the environmental community, and the environmental community understand that the business community is an essential part of finding the answers to these challenges, and it needs to be an ally. But the allies of the environmental community and the business community have to be frank enough to confront those of us in government that we have to be a player too. When you have a state legislature that says to save the planet, we have to implement AB 32, but they don't even discuss the exemption from CEQA so we can fast track it in time to save the planet. Now, you may say that's radical, but the same legislature exempted a football stadium in the city of industry. Mm -hmm. Football stadium was enough to, see, to waive it, but not saving the planet. So it's this degree of inconsistency that I want to say that we need to look at. Okay, Brian, you're a congressman, you're on the Committee of Jurisdiction, what are you doing? I'm actually saying, what are the resources that government has that can help the private sector as a partnership? Where can we do something at a time when there's no money to go around, we're in crisis, but we have assets that are far beyond writing a check or passing a mandate? And those assets are becoming participants in finding answers. If you've got somebody like, like um, Sapphire, that is looking for a place for production. The federal government has massive lands, totally unused, except for off-road vehicles running off across them, that is not available now. And my proposal is that the federal government approaches even more aggressively than what we've done with solar and wind by making public lands open. I propose that we create a federal greens, green fuel reserves in this country, that we take places like the Imperial Valley, where you have sections of land, huge sections owned by the federal government that is being used for recreational off-road. 
And we pre-permit those under the Clean Water, Clean Air, and the Endangered Species Act. And we go, government goes through those processes. So that when somebody wants to grow algae, they can come in and we allow them to homestead that land for the production of green fuels, and we use the Homestead Act as it applied to allowing farmers and allowed for the upper mobility of a middle class in the society by providing public lands as part of the answer. Those same public lands should be made available to those who are willing to come forward and invest in finding the green fuel future that we're talking about. It's dangerous politically to talk about this. You will have people walk out of here, tell somebody, and there'll be a headline, Bill Bray wants to give away our public lands to corporations. No, I didn't say that. But I said that we want to participate. If you have a company like Sapphire that has scientists here that are ready to go to production, and they know it's already permitted, it's already gone through the process, we've already got it, and it has, been, it has already been surveyed, and it's compatible with the technology, that's the kind of proactive stuff that government needs to do more of. We need to look at ourselves and say not only that 90% of stop signs could be yield signs, but we also got to say that we have great assets that, that are available today that could help in this and go far beyond getting to yes of finding these alternatives. Make it economically and socially and scientifically possible to reach the huge goals we have to do. Because the challenge is very, very large, ladies and gentlemen. And if government doesn't change the way we do business, if we cannot provide you with the next generation of government that does, isn't the cop telling you stop, 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 but is actually the kind of person that can actually be much like when you've got a firefighter that comes in and helps you um, do your house to make sure it doesn't burn down, is a partner in finding answers. That's what we need to do. Government has to be more of a partner working with rather than a, a uh, government's body that is dictating and, and uh, stopping and regulating. Because I think we basically we need to talk about something that outcome matters. I'll always remember a, a gentleman that worked here for a while, Roger Ravel, and I had the privilege of working with him. And he said, you know, Brian, an environmental regulation that hurts the environment or stops an environmental agenda is a sacrilege. And you, we've got not only the right, the responsibility to eliminate them even if there are those who think the law is more important than the environment. I think that we need to change government, change the regs, make sure we're working together. And by doing that, we not only, in my opinion, can save green fuel technology and have it produce here. I think we can learn that there are other industries that are leaving the state. There are other crises. Let's face it, the fiscal crisis right now didn't happen in a couple of weeks. This has happened over decades. I think by learning, by working together on green fuels, we can not only provide alternatives to, to the consumer and to this planet for green fuels, but we can learn how to change the relationship between the environmental community, the business community, and government. And everybody will benefit in the long run. Outside of that, I don't have an opinion about the issue. <laughs> excellent. All right, excellent. We have... Yeah, we always get the shrinking violets to talk for us. I know that. Okay, we have time for a few questions before lunch. Here, here. Oh, up in the back. John. Say who you are. Right. Yep. Let me say, first of all, we can't talk about just the Imperial Valley. As a federal uh, legislator, I have to make sure my legislation is general to where we've got a whole lot of sites. You know why? Yeah, because it would be, a, well, I'm just saying, it would be an earmark. I legally, under the federal system, can't talk about one location. But it just shows you how frustration the thing is. How we can do it is that we, we need to create, um, get the Department of Interior, first of all, to um, work at identifying those sites that are surplus and then identify those sites that have the terrain and the topography, which we have already done. We've actually had algae producers um, out surveying and looking at some of this stuff. And then you need, to, you need to basically reverse engineer it. Again, we have to look at it from the Endangered Species Act. 
We need to look at the Clean Water Act. We got to look at the, the, the Clean Air Act because you've got the whole issue of, of um, uh, silicon par uh, 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 particles and uh, PM10. Um, but all of those things where somebody is doing it ahead of the time as a government agency rather than waiting for somebody to show up from UCSD that's looking for a place to grow. Yeah. Bill or Tim from the state side? Oh, go ahead, Tim. Well, uh, I think one point to, to make is uh, that there are quite a few private landowners that uh, are interested in various options, including sugarcane. And some are growing cane there, energy cane, sugarcane. Um, it, it's going to be difficult. They have to look at everything in the context of what's my other economic uh, option that I have. And it's, it's mainly Bermuda grass and... Uh, other other grasses that are grown for animal feed, and almost 50% of that is exported to other countries. Um, so, so the, it's not just public lands, but they're private private lands, and uh, they're going to go through an environmental review. Water use is a key thing in that area, even though there are dedicated water water rights for many of those owner landowners, and. Um, uh, for a government type of process, I'd look to what the congressman is saying. This has been done to a certain extent with the Bureau of Land Management um, process for creating these kind of pre-permitted areas for uh, power plants, uh, solar photovoltaics, solar thermal, wind power, and several states on <coughs> federal lands. And it's been done in conjunction with every single state and local counties in those those areas too. Still some resistance to that from uh, many people. And, um, but they've kind of created a process that is, Bill, Bill Kenny alluded to it earlier, kind of a programmatic EIR process. That's probably the way, way to go. Another way to look at it is look at what parts of an environmental re review could be go into an exemption uh, guidelines, in this case California CEQA or NEPA, that you don't have to repeat the analysis every time you look at a new project. Yep. And there's some common ground across all areas where that should be looked at. If you look at the guidelines for CEQA today, where some of this has occurred, exemptions for hydroelectric, small hydroelectric, where no new dams are built, and cogeneration projects. I mean, that's in the guidelines today. Probably should be reviewed for all these biofuel and alternative fuel options, too. I, I, otherwise, it's, it's, it's going to take a process that, that uh, requires coordination with a lot of different entities. Department of Interior is going to be a key in that if it's federal land. Okay. You know, let me just say there's a prototype we've had done with habitat restoration. Uh, anyone around here has seen what's happened over the San Diego um, Valley uh, estuary in the last few years. If you had gone in there with a commercial project, you would have been hung for moving that much dirt, okay? That would have been, but because it was an environmental mitigation project, it was given fast track, it was given special consideration, and we should give our green fuel and our, our um, technology the same credibility and the same, uh, uh, you know, um, attitude as we give our environmental, our endangered species enhancement projects to. We, we really approach it differently if it's a mitigation project. I think the green technology ought to be applied as, an, as a, a green technology, um, as an environmental option. And let me do a point to when it be, don't mean to step on this too much, but this isn't just about places like the desert. When we're looking around where we can go to production, as somebody's a regulator, I'm looking at how do you get around having to go through all of the hoops again? And one opportunity I see is that every city in this, this country um, has some kind of activated sludge treatment one way or the other. A treatment that is very, very close to the, the algae production system in one way or the other. We have huge, huge cisterns not being used today. A good example is up in Encinitas. That is only about a mile from a producer of CO2, the power plant. And as anybody looking at the fact of what are we doing to use those government facilities that are there now, 
and be able to put them in production and ready for this because they're already permitted under the law for tr sewage treatment. If it is part of the sewage treatment plant, we should be able to expedite that procedure. So there's a lot of these kind of running through the gauntlet of regulatory obstruction that we need to kind of think about. And, I, and it's near and dear to me, again, because I was the bad guy who threw up all these barriers. So I feel an obligation to at least bring it up and try to tear some of them down. Excellent. Uh, Tim Zanker, Bill, any last comments before yeah, I, lunch? I just think uh, I agree with what everybody said other than to say that I think it goes to the issue of net environmental impact, is that when you want to take the, you want to take the uh, Imperial Valley as an example, we need to do an analysis of what the net environmental impact of various systems that would go in there, not just algae, but a, but a, a community of bio, uh, biofuels uh, in the area, both on the agricultural lands or the non-productive non lands and then the use of that water, and then evaluate what are the key barriers of, of actually getting through the process there. You have a number of vested interests in the areas, or water comes to mind, uh, agriculture, um, they've got to be at the table and they have got to be active partners, environmentalists, uh, in making that happen. A company like mine can't drive that process. We, again, trade time for money. That has to be done by somebody other than us, if you want us there. Okay. Bill, last comment. Um, well, you know, we have these uh, sustainability criteria in our, in our scoring and evaluation, and what we found is, is that the best projects tend to be the most holistic, and that is that they're doing remediation or mitigation. They're taking, um, uh, they're replace, you know, they have a number of co-products where they're displacing carbon-based or fossil-based uh, products and so on. And so those all go, when we do the GHG calculation, those are all credits that we uh, include. Uh, but we haven't explicitly put in our criteria, this idea that, you know, we give you extra points if you, you kind of take the whole, you know, a net environmental uh, improvement approach. And I think we can do that, and I think it would improve, uh, it would drive more of those projects being successful. Excellent. Thank you. Listen, I want to keep us on time. I, th this panel could obviously, not just the individuals, but we could talk on this panel, I think, for, for many hours. But I, I'd like to thank them all. That was fantastic. And hopefully, if our logistics is working out, there is lunch right outside. It is. I'm getting the nod that lunch is available right outside. I just want to mention one thing. We have one more panel. Tim Zank gave a great little shout out to him. It's going to be on resource requirements for this. That's going to start back here in a half hour. So please, lunch is quick, and then right back in here for our final panel. And we'll let you out of here on time. Thank you all.